Why, hello there, and welcome to Macronutrients 2 in Unit 2. How are you guys doing? I have thought of nothing but you guys since the last time we met. I've missed you. Now, admittedly for me, that was 15 minutes ago. So, you know, I've been all right. So today we're talking about um, protein and fluid. And the reason we're doing this is I had two options here, which is to make two very short lectures or one kind of beefy lecture. Um, I didn't like either of those, but this is the one I went with, which is one little, like, kind of beefier lecture, so, sorry. So, in this one, overall, we're going to discuss protein estimation, fluid estimation, and the disagreements involved in both of those. I'm sure it won't surprise you to learn that not everybody agrees in how to do this. You're old hands at this now. You you probably expected that. So, I'll start with protein. Uh, hey, there's not much disagreement in what protein needs are for the elderly. Note that. Mark it down. This is an exciting moment. The geriatric recommendation overall is 1 to 1.2 grams per kilograms of current body weight. There is a little bit of debate on this as to whether or not you should do that actual current body weight if the patient is obese. Some people will do an adjusted body weight, and there's more than one way to do an adjusted body weight. The general consensus is better to overshoot than under. Um, there are, remember that we're talking, the, the uh, younger adults average needs are 0.8 to 1 gram per kilogram of body weight. And the only kind of proviso with this is if there is a disease state that overwrites the general needs, we go with the disease state, just like you would with an, uh, anybody else. So if you have somebody on hemodialysis, those needs are higher than 1 to 1.2, so we're going with the hemo needs instead. So, um, I'm sure this won't surprise you to learn that uh, elders are at an increased risk of protein malnutrition. Uh, majority of elders likely do not receive enough protein. This is across the board. The highest risk group is uh, women with dementia, but again, all of them are at risk. So um, why, right? Uh, there are a lot of factors involved. Uh, socioeconomic factors are a big one. Uh, many elderly patients live alone or with maybe their spouse, but that, that also is an elderly person off, oftentimes. Uh, they just don't want to or can't cook for themselves. Either they're unable to or, you know, they're just it's very hard uh, to motivate yourself to do a thing like cook a full healthful meal unless that's kind of your jam already. So a lot of them just don't bother. It's a lot easier to say, you know, I'm, I'm going to make some ramen tonight than it is to make a, ver a, a very healthful um, meal that's you know, a lot of variety in it, especially over the week. Try to really sit down if you've never done it before and plan out like a week's worth of meals that meets all of the needs um, you know, all of the needs that you have, new different nutrition, nutrient needs, it's not easy. And you're trained at this. So imagine for somebody else. Uh, meat's expensive. Uh, all protein are expensive now. I realize I'm going to date this video at some point, but all protein is expensive right now. If you've been grocery shopping, wow, eggs, right? Eggs used to be the standard fallback for if you couldn't afford other meat sources, go for eggs. And uh, that's kind of out the window now too. All forms of protein are expensive. Uh, they're also unfamiliar or uncomfortable with alternate protein uh, sources. They have traditionally, now this is not everybody, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush here, but they tend to think of they need a meat, a starch, and a, a vegetable. And they're not comfortable with a meatless meal. Uh, they're especially uncomfortable with something like uh, tofu, say. So if you're trying to do some, convince them to do something like have some tofu, have some quinoa. Have, it's a very hard sell. They're they're very they want they prefer to stay in their lane. Selling them on a new food item is a little bit tricky. There's also metabolic changes. If you remember back to the introduction, we talked about gastric atrophy. That causes a decrease in hydrochloric acid. That makes it difficult to denature proteins that have been eaten. If that if they're not being denatured, they can't be absorbed. Uh, they have a, remember, a decrease in appetite and or early satiety. So overall, they have a lower intake 
and they tend to have a lower intake again of protein. What typically happens with someone with a decreased appetite, at least for an elder, is they'll often go for the starch first. So they may be getting enough calories and not enough protein. They also have, and by the way, if that kind of is ringing some bells in the back of your head, hold that thought. Uh, they also have decreased protein storage. Again, remember that we talked about how they have potential for decreased lean body mass. And that causes a, remember, lean body mass is kind of a sponge. It's a metabolic sponge. It holds water, it holds protein, it holds glucose. So a decrease in that decreases the amount of storage a person has. Uh, also health changes. We're looking at uh, debility, different kinds of maybe organ disease states, chronic uh, kidney disease, chronic heart failure. Uh, polypharmacy is a risk factor for protein malnutrition. And again, dementia itself is a risk for protein malnutrition. And protein intake is important. Uh, protein intake in elders has been positively, positively associated with increased quality of life. And it's been uh, negatively associated with um, outcomes. So remember that, um, remember what that means. So higher amount of protein, I feel like this is very badly worded in the studies. So what this comes down to is more protein, higher protein intake equals more positive outcomes. Decreased protein is a higher risk of negative outcomes or comorbidities. Protein supplementation can preserve current lean body mass to a point. Um, there are mixed results in these. Some of it, I think, depends on the type of protein involved. A recent study that came out showed that pediatric patients that needed protein supplementation did much better with, say, uh, natural peanuts than they did with a peanut-flavored product. Some of it may be something like that. Uh, these studies aren't really designed to check that, so this is sort of extrapolation on my part. But protein supplementation can preserve current lean body mass to a degree. And lean body mass and supplementation are both associated with positive outcomes. Also, the protein source may matter a bit. It does seem like there's more pronounced effect from animal sources of protein than plant. But again, these are some mixed results. So any protein supplementation in a patient is better than none. Uh, it is, however, likely with protein supplementation that you you may be able to slow the progression or the progressive loss of lean body mass. Likely supplementation is not going to be enough to uh, build anything back. In order to do to build something back, uh, the body has to be challenged. And we'll go into this some more later, but you know, we all know this. You need to do some resistance training. The, the body will only go as far as it needs to go. It's a survival machine. So if it doesn't have to expend energy or resources on building muscle, it won't. Now, there is some mixed evidence for this. Not so much for the re resistance training. It's more this mixed resistance to how much good protein supplementation by itself does. So, protein, uh, told you, it's, it's, it's short and sweet. Protein, TLDR, geriatric patients are at a high risk of protein malnutrition. Uh, there is not a single reason for this it's socioeconomic meta uh, metabolism health status. And remember that the RDA for protein in geriatric patients is higher than it is for younger adults, which often feels weird at the beginning. It may be less overall. It's a higher ratio. All right. Protein, ladies and gentlemen. So now we're talking about fluids. Uh, we're going to discuss how much fluid is needed, how do we calculate those needs, and how do we assess dehydration. So, why are elders at risk? Uh, loss of lean body mass. Remember uh, earlier I said that lean body mass is like a metabolic sponge. It holds water. The less lean body mass available, the less water storage is possible. Decreased renal function. Uh, can make it difficult to balance fluid needs. And recall also that elder patients may have more of a renal function impairment than we think because they have that artificial normal EGFR because of decreased lean body mass and decreased kidney function. There's a decreased perception of thirst in the elderly. That was also kind of hit on in the intro. Not really sure why at this point. There are 
ideas, there's uh, hypotheses, but we don't really know why that is the case. And also patients with dementia specifically may not be able to make their needs known. So what are the impacts of being dehydrated? Dehydration in the elderly increases the risk of frailty. And remember I said frailty is a specific thing and we, we are coming to that. Uh, bradyarrhythmia, stroke, it's a uh, positively correlated to length of stay and post-surgery recovery. It's like the length of it, and it's negatively associated to outcomes. So dehydration leads to poor outcomes. It's also associated with cognitive decline, enough that there have been suggestions that people that are displaying mild dementia symptoms may just be dehydrated. And perhaps the best thing to do would be to just try to hydrate them first. So what are the complications of dehydration? Um, obviously death, right? You don't drink enough for a while. Um, also, earlier, just a minute ago, we said that there's a suggestion that some dehydrated patients may be exhibiting symptoms of dementia. I know we haven't gotten dementia yet, and that is coming also. But so we're looking at dehydration can cause delusions, hallucinations, and a decrease in cognitive functions. Dehydration uh, can lead to increased skin breakdown and decreased wound healing. It can lead to a decreased immune response, and it can cause problems with pharmacological reactions. Remember that drugs are created and engineered to work in an aqueous environment. If that environment is more concentrated, less aqueous, they may not function at least as well. So why are they at risk? Um, well, I mean, why not, right? Because they're at risk for everything else. Um, it's really hard to tell if an elder is dehydrated. Remember I, earlier we're doing anthropometrics, or sorry, signs and symptoms. We're doing the skin test um, to see if there was tenting. But remember that their skin is one kind of dry and thin already. Also, it tends to be a little bit looser, so that may not be a good symptom or sign, I'm sorry. Um, physical symptoms can be differ, can differ and be misleading. And what, there's, what this is meaning is that the complaints that people would normally see for someone who's dehydrated may not exhibit the same way in an elder patient. Uh, people who are dehydrated are often kind of clammy, kind of dry feeling, Elders may sweat, which is, you know, makes it even worse. Lab values are also inconsistent. Frequently, just like with malnutrition and protein and albumin, excuse me, we want we want really want like a really solid good yardstick for how do we assess dehydration. And there isn't one. Uh, you can you know, for for younger adults, the sodium and BUN to check. But remember that these lab values may not be the same. They, they're not the same across the board for the population. And they may not even be the same for the individual. So looking at lab values is really not a fantastic guide either. And redu reduced thermosensory and thermoregulatory ability can lead to swift dehydration. And this is, again, one of those cycle issues. Decreased thermosensory and thermoregulatory can lead to dehydration a decrease in hydration status causes a difficulty in being able to thermoregulate, which leads to more problems. It's just, a, again, downward spiral. How much is uh, enough? So remember how much fun it was when everybody came together and all agreed on how much protein that, that elders should have? Uh, let's take that and wad it up and throw it out the window because we're back to this. There is no agreed system for hydration. Uh, part of that reason is because, you know, you're, we're never going to be able to test this. You're never going to be, I challenge you, to go and propose a research study that's going to say, I want to see how little fluid I can give somebody before we really start harming them. You know, we're never, that's never going to get past the ethics board. We're never going to know and honestly, I wouldn't want to be part of that study anyway. So the suggested tools that are available for use is milliliters per calorie, milliliters per kilogram. There's the WHO recommendations and the Chernoff equations. It's, you know, there's, there's more than one Chernoff equation. 
It's important to note that all of these formats received a grade of five, which is unassignable from the evidence analysis library. So none of these are validated. None of these are endorsed. These are all suggestions. The most common one I see is per kilocalorie. Uh, and again, this is a theoretical measurement that is taken from extrapolation from other mammalian species. The argument is that most mammals seem to require about one milliliter per calorie to maintain metabolic function. So probably that's the minimum standard for humans too. Um, some people, some people, I shouldn't say that, some organizations suggest a 1.5 milliliter per calorie due to potential uh, underestimations in caloric intake and greater risk of fluid loss in the elderly. So just like the protein needs were pumped up a little bit for some insurance purposes, so too is fluid in, in this model. Uh, the Academy does endorse yeah, a little tepidly, to be honest, uh, 25 to 30 milliliters per kilogram. These calculations are by actual body weight. I don't love this system myself. Um, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I'm just telling you my experience and my practice on this. Given that adipose tissue is so much less active metabolically than lean body mass, I don't know that I like this because the difference between a healthy, lively, active 70 year old who, you know, woman and a, um, frail elderly 70 year old female in a nursing home. Those are two separate people. They have different metabolic makeups. They're not, I don't feel like that rubber stamping of numbers is going to work well, but it may be a good starting point. Who recommendations are um, just a standard number. It's 2.7 liters a day for females, 3.7 liters a day for males. I have the same issue with this personally as I do with the A&D recommendations. It feels a little bit rubber stampy to me. But again, it's, it is at least a good base to start from. And there are the turnoff equations. I've, I've got one here. There's a few. Feel free if you want to use the turnoff equations. You can look up some other ones. This is this is the shortcut. This is the short version of this equation. Um, you can see it there yourself. It assumes a base requirement of 1,500 milliliters of fluid a day. And again, that is a bit rubber stampy, but uh, we guess we have to start somewhere, and we don't, again, have a standard. So 15 milliliters. The risk of giving someone too much water is pretty mild unless they have a condition already. Uh, maintaining hydration status in the elderly is extremely important. Remember, they can become dehydrated quickly. Their reactions to being dehydrated are much more severe than an average adult. Uh, many facilities have what they call r, &R programs, which is rotation and rehydration. And this is a standard model to remind care staff. It's usually every two hours to go in, move people if they cannot move themselves very easily, and like, move them from the chair to the bed. I mean kind of help them rotate, shift position, and give them some water. Uh, everybody on the care team should be pushing fluids at all times. Uh, both invasive and non-invasive invasive measures are effective, but, you know, I mean, it's kind of the same thing as labs. If we can get somebody to drink water, or I don't care if they're dehydrated, whatever, Gatorade, Kool-Aid, tea, um, it's, uh, that's way better than sticking them with a um, IV and giving them saline, right? So we can get them to drink, we should, but all, all interventions are better than no interventions. All right, this is the hydration wrap. So elders are at increased, in, increased, increased risk of dehydration. There is no one agreed upon formula. Invasive and non-invasive approaches are both effective. And remember to always encourage fluids. That is proteins and fluids. I will catch you on the next one. Bye.